Good morning, my name is Mike Silberg. I thank you for joining us this morning. The title of this talk is The Gospel of John. And this is part one. There's gonna be three parts. And uh, this one is just a general overview of the Gospel of John. We're gonna start with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you give us every day. And we especially thank you for your word which you've given to us and we thank you for the gospel of john and we ask your touch on this talk in jesus name we pray amen when we look at the four gospels the gospel of john stands out it is is totally different from the other three now what i want to do is show you real quick a little chart which describes the other three gospels they're called synoptic gospels you see that? Um, and if you notice, each circle represents one of the Gospels. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke, you can tell, are, are much larger than Mark. Now the purple represents um, the part of these Gospels that are identical. In other words, Matthew and Luke gleaned a lot of information from Mark. Most of Mark you can find in the Gospels of Luke and Matt and Matthew. So I just wanted to show that to you real quick because the Gospel of John is not like that. The Gospel of John stands by itself alone. Let's see if I can get this set right. It doesn't fall, okay. It stands all by itself. It doesn't glean information from any other Gospels. It's very unique. It, uh, it is much more introspective when he speaks about Christ and his teachings and miracles. In other words, we learn much more about the dynamics of the circumstances surrounding the miracles in the Gospel of John. And what we learn is the miracles Jesus spoke are as miraculous as the miracles themselves. For instance, of all the miracles Jesus did, only one is recorded in all four of the Gospels. Jesus feeding the 5,000. In the Gospel of Matthew, there's seven verses describing this. In Mark, 10 verses. In Luke, 6 verses. But in the Gospel of John, there are over 60 verses describing this one miracle, almost the whole chapter. And the conversation Jesus had with the people around him about him being the bread from heaven. You know, more than half of John's Gospel is strictly Jesus' teachings, not his miracles. Okay, now this is my chart basically breaking down the Gospel of John into three main sections. The first one is an introduction, which is uh, basically chapter one. Uh, the second part is Jesus' public ministry, uh, chapters two through 10, and it covers like over three years. The last part, this is in the Gospel of John, where it discusses the final days of Jesus, you know, centering around the last, this is only a two week period, basically. Um, and he covers it with, over half of his gospel goes to covering these final days of Jesus Christ. In fact, the, uh, the Last Supper uses five chapters just for the Last Supper alone. So the Gospel of John is uh, totally different from the other gospels. Okay, it begins with this great um, introduction. I call it a thesis at the beginning of uh, the Gospel of John. This opening thesis, it's a well-known introduction which lasts through verse 18, and it's profound. It is a summary of exactly who Jesus was and is and what he came to do. A writing instructor I once had said this, 
When you begin writing your book, first explain to your readers what your thesis is, what it is exactly you're trying to tell the people. Then imagine someone reading your opening statement and then saying to you, prove it. That's what the rest of your book is for, to prove it, to prove your opening statement, your thesis. That's what these first verse, first 18 verses of John's Gospel are. It's his opening thesis. In the beginning was the Word, etc., etc. And the rest of John's book proves Jesus is the Word made flesh. You know, after John's opening thesis, he continues in chapter 1 with a description of John the Baptist's ministry and how he was sent before Jesus to identify him as the Messiah to the nation of Israel. It's very interesting how John the Baptist describes Jesus. I'm going to quote some of this from the first chapter of John. John the Baptist said, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He saw Jesus coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I have seen the Holy Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. This is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I have testified that this Jesus is the Son of God. After Jesus is declared to be the Christ by John the Baptist, John directs his two disciples, John and Andrew, to stop following him and to now go follow Jesus, which is what they do. And the chapter, this chapter 1, ends with Jesus choosing three other disciples. Although this may be one of the greatest chapters describing the divinity of Jesus, John describes no public miracles being done by Jesus in this chapter. John 2 describes Jesus' first miracle at the wedding of Cana, where he turned the water into wine. John 3 is where he has his discussion with Nicodemus, you know, about being born again. Chapter 4, uh, he goes, uh, speaks with a woman at the well about him being the living water. Chapter 5, he goes to the pool of Bethesda and he heals a man there. Chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. Chapter 7, Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles and again speaks of him being the living water. Uh, chapter 8, Jesus rescues the woman caught in adultery. Chapter 9, Jesus heals a man born blind. In chapter 10, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. Okay? Uh, if you notice, I, I put these, put these, stuff. Queen, please. Stop. Queen. No, Queen, stop. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, if you notice, I put stars here on some of these chapters. And what this is referring to is these are where miracles take place. Now it's interesting because in chapters 1, 3, 7, 8, and 10, and we could also include chapters 12 through 17, with, which describe Palm Sunday and the Last Supper, so that makes 11 chapters altogether. Together they make up over half of John's Gospel as far as volume. There are no miracles mentioned in these 11 chapters. Even when John does discuss Jesus' miracles in the other chapters, it is mostly about the teachings around the miracles and not the miracles themselves. This is very interesting because John is the only writer that describes how many miracles Jesus actually performed. John says there were many other signs Jesus performed which are not written in this book. And if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not be able to contain the books that would be written. In other words, everywhere Jesus went, he was doing miracles, healing people. There's probably no one in Israel that did not know of someone that had been healed by Jesus. And yet, John concentrated on Jesus' words, not his miracles. Another area that John con concentrated on was Jesus' final words to his disciples at what we call the Last Supper, or Holy Communion. There, Jesus celebrated his final Passover meal on the very day he was crucified. In the other three Gospels, the writers describe this Passover in less than half a chapter, some less than a quarter of a chapter, or less. In John's Gospel, he, divides, he devotes five whole chapters, chapters 13 through 17, to this Passover meal. 
and the discussion Jesus had with his disciples. The interesting part about what John recorded is what he didn't mention. He didn't mention Jesus instituting Holy Communion like the other three gospel writers did. So we're going to look at these five chapters real quick, describing the Last Supper. In chapter 13, Jesus washes his disciples' feet, including Judas. Then Judas goes out to betray him shortly after that. This chapter concludes with Jesus giving his disciples and us a new commandment, that we love one another as he loved us. If you think about what Jesus is commanding us to do, He's commanding us to wash one another's feet. Or, in other words, he's commanding us to serve each other, even to serve those who we know are betraying us. That's the level of God expects us, commands us to attain to. He gave us a new commandment to love as he loved. The next three chapters, 14 through 16, are basically John recording a running monologue by Jesus <coughs> excuse me, about the soon coming Holy Spirit. This was very important to John to make sure he had this conversation written down for us to understand how God was going to be there for us after Jesus had left. We're going to discuss these three chapters in chapter 17 in the next part of this talk, which is part two. Chapter 17, which is the last of these five chapters, uh, in the Last Supper is Jesus' great high priestly prayer, and we'll get into that next time. The next three chapters, 18 through 20, joins the other Gospels and describes Jesus' suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas' betrayal, Jesus' arrest, his trial, his condemnation, his crucifixion and burial, and finally his resurrection. John ends his Gospel with an addendum in chapter 21. It almost seems to be an afterthought by John. It describes an interesting encounter Jesus had with Peter and John and five other disciples after Jesus' resurrection. John is coming full circle. The gospel starts with John being, being at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and it ends with John being at the end of Jesus' ministry. He started out in chapter 1, describing how he became one of Jesus' first, if not the first, of Jesus' disciples. And John concludes his gospel in chapter 21, a few days before Jesus leaves the earth at his ascension by describing what may have been Jesus' final words to John. John mentions in a mysterious way, I'm sorry, Jesus mentions in a mysterious way that John may remain until he comes. And then Jesus explains whatever happens to John is just between him and John and nobody else. John explains that he wrote his books so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God. John signs his gospel off by referring to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John never refers to himself by his name. And that he is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Probably the verses that best sum up John's gospel are the ones he starts out with in chapter 1 with his opening statement, his opening thesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And here's the punchline. And we saw His glory. That's what the Gospel of John is all about. John was an eyewitness to Jesus' entire ministry. John was an eyewitness to Jesus' glory. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine on us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Gospel of John. Music Maestro. Music Maestro. He gave you freedom and the power of prayer. He waits at the altar. Introduction.
Public ministry. Final days. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John says, we beheld his glory. 